Welcome to Old Path and our Through the Bible Studies. We are currently in the book of Proverbs. Actually, we begin it today, and this is our Monday uh, Bible Studies, which we go through the Old Testament. And uh, if you're new to the program, we systematically go through every uh, book of the Old and New Testament. We just happen to do Old Testament on Mondays, and we do New Testament on Thursdays. We're currently in the book of Revelation on Thursdays. Um, I record this a week from today is the election here in the uh, United States. So uh, obviously 2024 is when I'm recording this and we're at the end of October. So with uh, all of that being said, um, I wanted to, um, if I could, just kind of go over a, a few things that, that uh, detailing uh, as far as the election is concerned. And then something that I want to touch on as far as the website is concerned. And, uh, and let me just get to those things very, very briefly. I don't want to take too much time on them. First of all, as far as the uh, election is concerned, um, every election season, this becomes a big, big topic about Christians and voting and all that kind of stuff. And, and some people will absolutely not be involved in the vote. They refuse to be able to, or to, uh, to vote for one uh, candidate or another, and uh, they just, again, they completely abstain. Uh, I am not one of those, uh, nor is my family. I believe that there's just too much at stake in this, and uh, the fact that we uh, don't engage, I think, sometimes just really is kind of to our, our detriment. Uh, there is no such thing as the perfect candidate, and uh, neither one of the candidates would I look at and say that, that uh, they track with me across the board. Um, but I also, in the, if I want to look at it as practical or pragmatic, whatever you want to say, I'm going to have to live under the governance of one of these two people. So uh, whether it's uh, the, the Democrat or the Republican side, those are the two major parties. And one of those two parties is going to give us the next president of the United States. So as far as that's concerned, uh, when I look at them side by side and do a comparison, uh, do either one of them hold my view as, as it pertains to life? And uh, when it comes to the abortion uh, topic or uh, when it comes to matters of, of, uh, of gender and how the government should be involved in, in dealing with that whole question that's coming up and alternative lifestyles and all that kind of thing. Um, the two of them are probably too, well, they are definitely to the left of me on those particular topics as a biblical conservative. But I do know that there is a quite a bit of difference between the two of them on those views. And uh, especially when it comes to the government's view on these things. Uh, fortunately, as far as the president is concerned, there's not as much that they can do since, uh, especially on abortion, that's now a state's rights kind of an issue. And uh, it's more important to fight that on the state level because it's not federal anymore. Uh, and that's the only thing that the um, that the uh, uh, Supreme Court did in overturning Roe was send it back to the states. So any any uh, politician on the federal side that tells you they're going to do something about abortion and all the rest of it are just lying to you uh, because they think that you're gullible and they think that the electorate is gullible. So uh, if they're on a federal level, um, they can come out and they can you know make statements about stuff, but it's still a state's issue. So again, just to make this very, very brief, when I compare uh, compare both of them side by side, uh, there is a, a quite a bit of difference uh, between the two of them. And uh, so as far as that's concerned, Making the uh, decision is is a pretty simple one for me as a private citizen. And uh, so if anybody is curious about that, want to know where I sit on these particular things, or if they think that uh, voting is just a waste of time, that's fine. Um, if you would wish to discuss it with me, you can do so through the uh, through email. Uh, I'll speak to you as a private citizen and not as a pastor. Won't make recommendations saying something in the name of the church that you should do. But as a private citizen, I am not at all um, having to be silenced on things. Um, so anyway, as far as that's concerned, I think that the vote is very, very important. Uh, I think matters as far as life is, uh, again, it's an important thing on a state level. That's why I will be, be very careful about my state representatives and who those people are. But as far as, uh, you know, what's going to be as far as day to day life living in the in this world and uh, in this country in particular, there are different views absolutely about how much government should be involved in the day to day lives of us between the two parties. That's obvious uh, how they're going to deal with Israel. Obvious. There are a number of things that I think are very, very obvious about the uh, the views of the of the candidates. So I do hope that uh, people become very educated. And uh, I know this doesn't go over very well, but if people do not educate 
educate themselves on on the issues um, maybe it's probably better that they just sit home and uh, that's I know that that bothers some people but uninformed electorates are, are very dangerous so as far as that's concerned that's about as far as I'll go with it one other thing came up here just recently uh, the church that I came from uh, when when I left California almost five years ago coming up on five years ago after the first of the year um, Calvary Chapel or Calvary Old Path. We are part of the Calvary Chapel family at Cyprus and myself as a pastor within the group. But uh, we had changed our name out there in the uh, in the California Cyprus area, uh, mainly because of things that were taking place among the Calvary Chapels. And we wanted to be a little bit distinguished from what was happening at Costa Mesa. So uh, we renamed the church. Gosh, it's going on, I don't know, seven or eight years ago. Uh, we changed it to Calvary Old Path. Now, when I came here, I just continued on as Old Path Ministries because I felt that it was important uh, to uh, to just be an extension of what we were doing there in California. They are currently changing the name back to Calvary Chapel of Cyprus. Uh, I haven't asked why. I don't think there's anything other than that they want the uh, familiarity of the name. And, and I don't know, I, I, again, I don't know the whole reasons behind it. But I know that that has created a little bit of a surprise to some people. And I just want to make sure that people know if, if you do support our ministry financially um, and you I, all of my support goes through um, ultimately it goes through Cyprus but um, if it if it gets sent through that Cyprus website through old path in Cyprus uh, it may very well not get to the intended location or, or to uh, to this ministry in particular so if you do support the ministry uh, it's best to do it through old path theology net not old path or Calvary Chapel of Cyprus they're two different things because they will receive uh, online support through that website and I receive support through this website here though it goes through them for the the 501 reasons and that you'll get a receipt it's tax deductible so as far as that's concerned just want to make sure that you knew that if you're not aware of that I think there was some confusion with a couple of people and so I don't know how widespread that might be so if you use our or if you use online donations um, you and you want it to come here and and get to old path theology through the ministry that i do here in texas go through our website which is oldpaththeology.net i'll probably make that announcement for a few weeks and then i'm going to let it go uh, i'm very much like my pastor before me and that he did not like to ask for donations and didn't like to make that the the part of the ministry uh, he never talked about that unless it was in the text but this was something that i think came up i know it came up in the last week with one person and i think that there was some confusion about where should support go if you're mailing it in it can be mailed if it's something that you write out as a check that can still go to um to the church there in cyprus and if you need the uh, details on that you can let me know i'll give you the address actually it's p.o box 769 in cyprus california 90630 and just earmark it for um old path in texas and then they'll make sure it gets to the right location all right so that's that hopefully that's uh that's as much as i'll have to do on that for a while now book of proverbs since we've just finished the book of psalms we're going to go right into to proverbs and we'll move along with the whole thing so I want to just make sure that we uh, understand that what what you find here with Solomon he's a an intriguing guy and I want to look a little bit at his history before we go into it we're only going to cover the first what six or seven verses of this because he really actually it's the first six verses and then he says something that's actually in verse seven it shows it as a different paragraph it really is along the same thoughts but what you get in verse seven is kind of a, a a preview of what you're going to see repeated often or for the most part of the book of Proverbs but you could look at at Solomon putting these things down as just his observations and so um, we're going to find that the word parable is used in the very first verse uh, not parable I'm sorry uh, but proverb is used in the very first verse and we'll look at kind of what those things are as far as synonyms are concerned so that we're familiar with what's you know what the the purpose behind them is but you're going to have a number of uh observations that solomon is going to make and he refers to this as going to young men other times you'll see that he's saying it's uh, it's to sons and so the primary audience is that he's talking to young men and that comes up in the in the text here but before we go just in case i i fail to say it 
the uh, the passages that we're going to look through, um, though they are usually addressed to when he addresses them to anybody that would be considered an age uh, particular group and even gender, he's writing these to younger men. And uh, but that does not mean for a moment that they are not intended for general audience or don't have application to general audience. Now, there's times when he talks about uh, as a young man not being seduced by a woman. Well, of course, that's not going to uh, to uh, translate completely straight across to other women biblically. Um, but the, to the women, it could be the same thing, you know, falling for the enticements of a younger man or of a of a man. So the, the, when we get to those things, we'll just show, you know, we, we can make them, we can take the gender out of it as far as the principle is concerned. But let's remember that when we're reading the Bible, we're really reading kind of often, we are reading um, the, the private thoughts from one person to another, sometimes to a more general audience, but we're not the initial subjects or we're not the initial uh, intended audience. So we're, we're reading something here that's 3,000 years old. And uh, the things that he says, of course, they're incredibly practical. That's what the reason for a proverb is, is practical, understandable things that we see in the observable world around us. And they're based upon the, the firsthand wisdom and experience of, of a guy like Solomon. Now, the idea that they're being passed along from one person to the next, this is what Solomon's concern is. He wants to make sure that he's passing along to the next generation of people things that he has learned over a lifetime, whenever it was that he was writing this. Now, you'll find that that's very, very similar when, when you see what Paul has to say about church order when he's writing to either Timothy in 1 Timothy or if he's writing to Titus when he's writing from pastor to pastor about church order. And he hits this in, in both of those, uh, those instances to those pastors, have your older men minister to and mentor or disciple the younger men. And same thing, the older women with the younger women. And really it doesn't have to be like, you know, old as far as some age group is concerned, but it's it's more in the sense of maturity of the person that's passing it along to the next person. Because, you know, people will get saved much later in life. And somebody who is much younger in life when they get saved has an awful lot more knowledge. So they could both wind up at, say, 50 years old. But if the person got saved at 20 and they're now 30 years walking with the Lord, will have much more to say to a fellow 50 year old that got saved a week ago. So you see how that that whole thing works. It's it's based upon, you know, you have this wealth and this reserve of knowledge and you want to pass it along to the people that are next to you and uh, the reasons why we believe what we believe. Now, interestingly enough, if you understand a bit of the history here, here is Solomon talking to the next generation and to these people that he would be speaking to. Again, we don't have the specifics of who it is. It could be very general. It could be too younger. Maybe even in this case, when he says to a son, we don't have the identification of who it is, but we do have a great example of where a son did not heed the counsel and the things that he would have heard from his father. Because here's here's what I mean by that. When Solomon died, the, the kingdom was left to his son uh, Rehoboam. And Rehoboam was counseled by the people that were there with his father, Solomon. He would have heard the things from Solomon to whatever extent he had. But the people who had been around Solomon also had uh, Rehoboam's ear. Then Rehoboam also gathered to himself another group of people entirely, much younger people, not as experienced as the other ones, who gave him the completely opposite counsel. And he became kind of a dictator, authoritarian, so much so that, that it caused a split and a rebellion within the nation. And it's why we understand that there are southern and northern tribes. The split happened right after Solomon died and because his son did not do the kinds of things that we're seeing right here in the book of uh, of, Saul, of, of, um, of Proverbs, that he wasn't listening to sound, wise counsel, and he listened to unsound, unwise counsel from younger people who didn't understand things as they thought that they did. So we have an example of where what Solomon's really kind of uh, sending out right here was not really heeded by his son. And then look at the fallout of it and look at what ended up happening as a result of that. The nation never recovered from it. So there's a real wisdom in passing this along. And people who have a wealth of knowledge and understanding and personal experience 
as far as these things are concerned, it's very good that that gets passed on from generation to generation. So very, very wise counsel that's given as far as that's concerned. Now, as far as Solomon is concerned, um, I'll give you a couple of places to go and look at this. We, we don't have to go into the actual uh, passages themselves. I'll just give them to you to go ahead and read. In 1 Kings chapter 3, you're going to find that, uh, that Solomon is is recognizing the gravity of what's upon him at that point. David has died. Solomon is now uh, at that place of, of having to come to the full realization of who he is, what's expected of him, but you're always going to be in the shadow of your father. You know, just again, think about that. You're the next guy up after David's gone, and he's the king by whom all other kings are measured. And it's early on. He's only the third king, Solomon, and, and David was only the second, obviously. But going forward, you pretty much know that you've got shoes to fill, and he feels the weight of it. So in uh, in 1 Kings 3, God sees him or, or comes to him, I guess you could say, um, in, a, in a vision, in a dream, and then asks of him, says to him, rather, ask of me, what could I give you that, uh, that could give you the ability to do this? Because Solomon, by that point, had already made the admission. Look, I'm David's kid. I don't know how to lead the nation out or bring them back in. That idea of, of thinking of warfare and all the rest of it. How do, I, how do I govern this people? Who can possibly do this? So he's a very humble man at that point. And he recognizes that. And so when God asks of him, what would you have me to give to you? He's very humble about that and says, I don't know how to do what I'm being asked to do. So he asks for uh, wisdom in how he could be the man that God wants him to be. And so God answers that and says, you answered this so very, very well. Because you didn't ask for all the things that normally people would ask for, <clears throat> riches and power and, you know, victory over your, your, uh, your enemies, all the rest of that stuff. <clears throat> but rather you asked that I would give you what is necessary to govern my people. I'm going to make you a, a person, as far as wisdom is concerned, like the world has never seen. Nobody will ever be greater. Nobody ever has been or will be greater than you as far as this is concerned. Wisdom and knowledge and understanding that kind of stuff. And I'm going to give you all the other things that you didn't ask for. So he starts out about as well as anybody could ever hope to start out. God asks him, ask of me what you want. He not only gives him the one thing that he asks in measure that's never been seen before, but he gives him everything else. Now, so... If that holds true, then you would figure that for his entire life, this man would do exactly what he's supposed to do, and he would be actually greater than even his father. He had that potential because of what happened. Now, when you read the book of, of Ecclesiastes, and we'll get there, that book starts out where he just says, vanity of vanities, there is nothing new under the sun. It's just futility, and, and my gosh, it's depressing when he first says what he ends up saying. <clears throat> so he just comes to a place for a guy with, you know, ability and, and wisdom and all that stuff more than anybody's ever had to write what you see there in Ecclesiastes at the beginning of it, that there is nothing new under the sun. Everything is vanity. And he just sounds like a, a defeated, you know, frustrated man. So how does he get to that point? And what we have for the answer, it's very obvious. It's found also in 1 Kings, but it's in chapter 11. And it's where it tells us that, that Solomon loved many women. And so he accumulated to himself. He's basically the man who could never say no. And so unfortunately, he accumulated 300 wives three, and 700 concubines. That's what the Bible tells us. Now, again, concubines, wives, and all that stuff come to him for the most part as a way of, of entreaty from other nations and kings and people that are trying to get the favor of Solomon. And they come from all over the world. And basically, they're just a collection to him, which is really kind of a sad, disgusting kind of a thing, sad to say. But it shouldn't have been such. This was never what God had ever intended. God was not into polygamy, um, you know, counter to what some people think. That's man taking it on himself. Anyway, long and the short of it, they turned his heart away from God. Read it for yourself, 1 Kings uh, chapter 11. So by the, the culmination of the book of Ecclesiastes, he comes to the point. So what's the whole point of this? And the whole book of Ecclesiastes is just 
I've, I've made so many mistakes. This, this is what I've come to learn. And he's never, you know, he, he didn't follow where he had begun. So if you take Ecclesiastes and put Proverbs side by side, here is in Proverbs, Solomon saying, here is wisdom. What he did in his life was not apply wisdom. And it really created in him a very big and very real frustration at the end of his life that he would say, everything is vanity. I didn't do what I should have done. I knew better and I didn't. And so at the end of Ecclesiastes, when he summarizes the whole thing, he just says, so what is the summation of all of this? Do what God says. That's man's all. <laughs> and so you go, the smartest, wisest guy that's ever been boils it down to that. Be obedient to God and everything will work. But his life did not follow that pattern. He was very much at the beginning an obedient man. He fell into the folly in the middle of his life by being turned away from his God, only to come back at the end of his life to say, I've squandered so much. If only I had done what I was in what I was supposed to do from the beginning. So there it is. That's the life of Solomon, a very, very interesting character. And uh, he made, unfortunately, he made the mistakes that he did. Uh, and it, again, it was to the it, it was to his own peril. It was to his own destruction in the way of his his kingdom, not because of his, you know, he didn't lose his life because of it. But so much about him on a personal level is so much missed opportunity. And uh, we have the reasons why. Again, you read the book of Ecclesiastes, you know that something's going on. So go and read those. And if you have some feedback, please let me know uh, in the in the comment section on YouTube uh, or through email, however you like. Again, the, the website is oldpaththeology.net. Book of Proverbs, chapter 1, verse 1. Let's have a word of prayer and let's take a look at our text. Father, we thank you so much that we can come to your word and that it has so much to say to us, so much that we can learn, so much that we can glean. We pray, Father, that you would give us instruction as we read it here. We give you all thanks and praise and ask that you would direct us by your spirit. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, um, as we look at the proverb, let's read the first six verses and, and uh, we'll move on from there. Um, it says, now, the, uh, the proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, the king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity, to give prudence to the simple uh, and to the young man knowledge and direction, a discretion rather. A wise man will hear and increase learning. A man of understanding will attain wise counsel to understand a proverb and an enigma, the words of the wise and of their riddles. Now, what he's done is just told you in these six verses the reason for the entire book. And it's so that he can pass along from one generation to the next the things which is the culmination of a life and those things that can be passed along. So there are so many words here that we see in English that we may be very familiar with. Other ones, because we don't use them so often, they have a lot of what we'll look at as similes. or um, um, We'll look at the similes of it. And so it's it's an English word that we might use, but here's some other words that we use probably more regularly. So I'm going to kind of go through that as we go through these verses and say, what exactly is he getting at here? So what's his reason for doing this? And again, what we're going to find as we go through this, you're going to see as we go through, and this is the last book that I taught on Sunday mornings before moving here to Texas. We went through the Proverbs and I found out immediately that the things that he would put down here as, as just principles and things that, that were his observations to the New Testament believer, we say what Solomon says here is wonderful and accurate and it's good. But boy, when we see it expanded in the New Testament, it takes on a completely different dimension. And it just helps you to realize that the New Testament believer has so many more things that are revealed to us that were just hinted at in the Old Testament. And you really see that in Solomon's writing here, because we will say, like with a lot of times in the Psalms, oh man, if you could have only seen it through my eyes, Solomon or David, what God has revealed in these times is just superior. There's so much more to it. But what he says here, here's the reason why I want to write these things. Because this life that he has, sorry, itchy leg, uh, this, this life that he has lived has provided for him a wealth of knowledge and, not, and, and wisdom and all the rest of it. That's why he says, here's the reason why he wants to do this. So as we look at the first verse, 
and it just says uh, the identification of who is it that's writing and who is then his recipient. You'll see it's a, it's to young men. Sometimes he'll refer to them as sons. The, the Proverbs and the Proverbs are just the, the similes. They're the parables. There are some parallels. The person that's wise will do this. The fool will do that. There's a lot of that just parallel side by side. The, the point and the counterpoint, and they're very, very just quick. Sometimes he will run through them in one verse and move on to a different topic in the very next verse. So they come at you very, very quickly. They're, some refer to them as kind of pithy, means that they're just bang, bang. There's no real, uh, no real description. There's no elaborating on it. It's just straightforward. There is this and there is that, period, end of story, move on. So much of it is written that way. So we see that that they're intended, though, for instruction as, as kind of parables will be, because sometimes there's just metaphor that's used. There's a whole lot of creative ways <clears throat> that Solomon is conveying a thought and making sure that the people that are hearing him get the instruction that comes along with it, because really it's intended to do that. It's intended to take the reader through the thought process of Solomon so that the outcome would be favorable, that they would walk rightly and honorably before God, and that they would be successful. That's the reason for his writing. So when he says it's the Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, the king of Israel, that gives you his pedigree and what has he learned over a lifetime. And it's by his own personal observations. But let's remember, you can learn so much by watching someone else. You'll hear it from me every once in a while. I say it a lot, and, you know, off camera as well. I would rather find or learn something from a, a person that's bloodied up their nose in the process than for me to have to bloody up my nose in the process. Why can't I just learn from them and not repeat? That's that's the preferable way, I believe. And that's kind of what where Solomon's at in this whole thing. So it is, as he says, it's to know wisdom and instruction to perceive the words of understanding, verse two, and then to receive the instruction of wisdom justice, judgment, equity, and then to give prudence to the simple. So the first part, here's why he would want people to understand what he is saying here. So verse two tells us it's so that you can know wisdom. So here's where I want to get into the similes. So what does he mean by no? Now, a lot of times we think in the Old Testament, or I'm sorry, the New Testament sense, because of Greek words, there's a knowledge that you can gain because you've heard it from someone else or you've read it in a book. Or it's, it's some other way that you've had third party, some other way other than your own personal observations and your firsthand experience yourself. In this case, he's, he is speaking from his own personal understanding, and we are then the recipients of this. But when we read these things, we can probably say, I understand exactly where he's coming from because I've gone through those things. So firsthand, we're getting it from him. If we've experienced it ourselves, then we are in the same place that he is, and we're able to say, yep, I've learned that myself. Now, if we come across things that we have not necessarily encountered on our own, then great. We're still getting a third party, but we'd be wise to pay attention to what he has said. Now, let me get this out of the way because it's one of my favorite things. You, Some of you, those of you who know me the longest, know I, I've used this a number of times. And I I, I stole this one from my daughter. Uh, and it's, it's an updated version of something that I had said long before that. So um, I used to use the word tomato. She used avocado. So knowledge, you can know something. Knowledge is that avocado is a fruit. You can know that. It's not a vegetable. It's a fruit. Now, wisdom would be that you don't put it in a fruit salad. So fruit salads usually are, depending on what kind of things you have in it, it'll have pineapple, it'll have cantaloupe, it'll have honeydew, uh, it'll have maybe strawberries, who knows? Whatever you like, put it in, you put it in there. And a fruit salad is something that different people, depending on what they like for their fruit, they'll put in whatever they like. They would not put an avocado or a tomato, which is also a fruit in, in that category. You don't put that in a fruit salad. So you can know something, but wisdom is not something that is is actually can be applied until you're doing what you know to be true and then act accordingly. That's where wisdom comes into this. So wisdom is taking what you know to be true and applying it to whatever the situation may be. So. We don't want to use them interchangeably because they're not. To know something is not necessarily to be wise. It's not wise until you do the correct thing with the knowledge that you have. Again, 
Don't put avocado in a fruit salad. It'd be disgusting, right? It just doesn't have that same thing. We think of fruit as being sweet, but there are some things that are considered fruits that are not actually fruit in the sweet sense, so you wouldn't add them in with the sweets. So you all get it. Now, I can't get the smile off my face because it's just funny. Thinking of a fruit salad with pieces of avocado it will look pretty ridiculous. So anyway, fun. Here is what he says. These proverbs are given for this reason, so that people can know, and that knowing is, it's by word, it's by experience, it's by things that you've observed, or you're taking it from the first-hand observation of the person who's there. So here's his intention. It's that you would know wisdom, and it's decision that, wisdom is a decision that you make based on the knowledge that you have. You know what to do, and then you do it according to that knowledge, because it'll have you with the correct outcome. Wisdom is always intended to bring about the correct outcome based on your knowledge. So to know wisdom and then to uh, know also instruction. Now you're going to find that he uses these words consistently all throughout the Proverbs. We're going to see things like wisdom, knowledge, uh, instruction, all of that kind of stuff. He's going to use these words commonly throughout all of these Proverbs. So again, the instruction then would be discipline, um, and it doesn't have to be in the sense of being punished, but just discipline that you, you make yourself disciplined to an outcome. You do these things because this is the wise course of, of, uh, of um, it's, it's the wise course to follow. So I will discipline myself. I will govern my, my own body and life and whatever it may be to do the, the correct thing here. That's the instruction that's being referred to here. So it's to know wisdom and instruction and then rather to and then going on to perceive the words of understanding and the perce perceiving is to discern so it's to make a decision on one thing or the other so again there's the instruction there's the disciplining of the mind there's the focusing of those things but then there is the acting upon it's, it's kind of the same relationship that you have with wisdom and knowledge you also then have with instruction and then all, also perception what must i do in order to bring this about so it's to perceive, it's to discern the words of understanding, and understanding just means knowledge. It's you've, you've come to a, a knowledge of the things that you're supposed to do. He's using a lot of words here that kind of get us to the exact same place. So, which a lot will happen often in the book of, uh, of Proverbs. But it's, he's put these things there so that it would kind of set a baseline of this is knowledge, this is wisdom. What do you do from that point? Because he's shown you this part is important. This is the knowledge. And if you're wise, you will you will act accordingly. Now it goes to the individual. You are to ascertain or to discern whether or not you're following the instruction that he has given here. So you see how it's kind of building on it. So that you would perceive the words of understanding and that you would then as he says in verse three, to receive the instruction of, of wisdom. And so again, the, the receiving is that you'll take it in hand, you'll take hold of it. So once again, everything is out there, but until you appropriate it, he could be the best instructor of all kinds of things. He could say, here's what I know. This is what knowledge is. And wisdom is to act upon that knowledge. But then he throws it to the person that's, that's hearing these things. They then have the decision to make of what is the right thing. Now think about it in his own work, the, the working of his own mind. If you're Solomon, you would realize, look, if, if I am the king of Israel, I am going to have people trying to make peace with me. And one of the ways that they are going to do is do that is to offer me their daughters in marriage. And so if that's the case, if they're coming from foreign places and don't serve the God of Israel, they may very well, you know, want to follow pagan gods. That's not a good thing as far as the, the scriptures are concerned. God forbids it. And yet he did it so that you can see he knows what the law says. He clearly did not follow the law. So he had knowledge, but he didn't he didn't apply wisdom to it. You see the problem here now he can in hindsight look back and say, if only I had followed my own understanding and wisdom, but he didn't put those things in. And it wasn't because he didn't understand. It's didn't, it wasn't because he didn't perceive. It's because he acted according to his flesh and not to his better judgments. So the reason for a proverb would be to say, 
we should understand what we're doing and what could be the potential fallout of it. And I don't have to go to someone's opinion because the ultimate authority for this is what the scripture has to say on any given topic. So if we want to say, well, so where do we find the information about wisdom and knowledge and instruction and discernment and justice and equity and all those kind of things that we're reading in these verses? Well, the Bible is your source. So we don't have another source. There's no secondary source. And even if we would say, well, what about somebody that we would look to as far as wise? What about our pastor? What about our church? What about this, that, or the other thing? Well, if those sources are using the scripture, you're still coming back round, round ways to it. Whoever that person is, is going to be pointing you back to the scriptures because that's the only place where any of these things are found. They don't, they're, they don't exist somewhere else. God has his own way of communicating what is actual truth. He does that through his word. And anything that he would use as a source to convey that information, pastor, I don't even care if it was done by an angel, it's always going to point you back. You'll be able to prove it through the scripture. That's your ultimate foundation for anything that you will find going forward, period, end of story. Now, back to what he has to say. So he says, it is then for the person to perceive the words of understanding. And once again, the idea of perception is to discern the words. Now, that's whatever is used to convey these truths, whether it's the written word, the spoken word, whatever it may be. Solomon would have said all of these things to his sons and to anyone who would be younger, somebody who could pass it along to. He's also here. We can see he's also put it in writing. So then he says to receive the instruction, I'm sorry, perceive the words of understanding, knowledge, and then to receive. And that's to take to yourself the instruction or what wisdom will end up giving to you, the person who seeks. So again, this, re this requires two people. If it's going to be one person to the next, like Paul wants, as he says to Timothy and Titus, have your old men disciple the younger men. Very, very important thing. They're going to point them to the scriptures. They're going to say, and what the scriptures have to say, I've actually observed it with my own life. So Solomon's doing the exact same thing. There's a wealth of information that has been given to Solomon through the years. Let me pass it along to you. So it takes the person that will pass it along, and then it also requires the person that comes after. Now, uh, mentioning Calvary chapels, I have been around the Calvary Chapel movement now for next year will be 40 years. In those 40 years, I've been around a great number of, of men who I would look at over the years who were older in the Lord than I was. And I gleaned so much from those men. I learned from them so that I wouldn't have to learn for myself. Now, again, I would want to take anything that they had to say and check it against the scriptures. But watching and observing somebody who's been there time and time again, they are not thrown to the fits of, of fear and, and, you know, kind of uh, anxiousness as maybe somebody who's new in the faith because they've been there for a while. They've been through things. They've seen it. They understand it. So it's good to take hold of those things that you see from someone else as they pass them along, whether you watch them or whether you hear them. It's always, once again, you're going to find out whether they operate in a biblical sense. Are their answers biblical or are they emotional? Are their reactions to circumstances biblical? Because they're, again, they're, they're temperate, they're godly, they handle things in such a way that they don't get into fits of rage, they're not profane. They just handle things differently than the than the person in living in the world would. So this is what what Solomon's starting to get along to the people who are listening to him as we read these things again. There's a lot of uh, of similes here. So it is per, uh, it is to perceive the words or those things that are communicated verbally, words written out verbally, however it may be, that leads to knowledge or or to understanding. And then the last part, there is the receiving or the taking to yourself the instruction of wisdom. But then he adds in these pieces, justice, judgment, and equity. Now, when we get to justice, it is rightly and righteously hearing a particular situation and then making a, a determination of your course of what you're going to do. And then when we get to the second part of that, when it gets to the idea of judgment, that's when the verdict comes down. So how then will that be handled? Now, again, he's speaking about this. Think about it from a king's point of view. 
a king is going to have to say there is justice and judgment that needs to be import, it needs to be considered in this and equity needs to be done as well. Now, this also trickles down to the individual because it's not like we're a king running a nation. But we are, let's say, if, if we're a young man or if we're an older man and we have a home and we have children and we have situations that come to us, we have to look at something that's coming that we have to make a determination about. And so making a righteous judgment, when I look at all the information, would I come to the conclusion in what my actions are going to be that they're pleasing as far as God is concerned? And then when I come to that decision, that judgment, when I make my decision or my verdict, is it the correct one based upon a righteous judgment that I've made in the first place? And if it's going to affect someone's life, have I put my thumb on the scale because I want to favor one person over another? Of course, we would never want to do that. Um, equity would be, I'm not going to take into a, a account whether the person is rich or poor, whether I like them or dislike them on a personal level, whatever the case may be, none of that matters. Equity would be able to say, I only follow what is right and honorable as far as the scripture is concerned, and my personal feelings about this are put to the side. Now, when people serve on juries, that's what they're asked to do. <clears throat> of course, we know it's not human nature. So the things that he's asking us to do here, much of it is against human nature, right? Because we're, we're pretty much looking to do what only works or benefits us. It's not always that we're looking to be fair and impartial and only take where the facts lead you. It's not really necessary that way because, again, mankind's way is just a what's beneficial to me. Now, he goes on, he says this, to give prudence to the simple and the young man knowledge and discretion. So this is where he finally mentions young man. So again, this would be, <clears throat> is, is the person he's writing to, uh, you could look at it, if it's written to somebody else who's seen as mature, then you're supposed to pass it to the next man down the line. If it's Solomon speaking that I would be saying these things so that those young men under me as king, maybe my sons or people that are like that, nobles, whatever it may be, whoever is there to, to hear or glean from me, this is what they'll be able to hear as somebody who's experienced and learned in these matters. So it is then to give, as it says here, to give prudence. And that's just good common sense is what it's supposed to be. It's not being making decisions in some fit of, of angst and anxiety, but rather it's that just sensible, not given over to all kinds of excesses. It's just that quiet sitting back and making determinations. It's that idea of giving to the person, this young man, um, giving him prudence. And again, so prudence would be that good common sense. And then uh, to the, the person who is simple, um, actually, I, I jumped a little bit here, give prudence to the simple. Uh, the simple would be the person who just doesn't have the knowledge that's there. It doesn't mean simple like they can't get it. It's just that they're without that knowledge yet. So it's to give to them something that may, they may not yet understand so that when they get to that point, they already have the tools necessary to make the proper uh, decision. So he says this, then it is also then to the young man, knowledge and discretion. Knowledge, he's already used that same word again uh, up in the, uh, um, it, it's kind of, it's the difference of, of noun versus verb. When he talks about it at the beginning where he says to, uh, to know in verse two, to know is to actively as a verb to understand things, to know those things, it's an action. Here, it's spoken as a verb, you just have knowledge. Not that you're employing it, it's just something that you have. It's kind of the, if you know the difference between verbs and nouns. So he says, give prudence to the simple and to the young man, knowledge and discretion. And discretion is just thoughtfulness, working your way through the whole thing, not just, you know, knee jerk, first thing that comes to mind, that's going to be your reaction. So then he goes on and, and let me mention really quick here, because I had said before, if you're not a quote young man, does none of this apply to you? Of course not. This applies to every single human being. We should want to be doing these things in the exact same way that they're laid out here. Now it says a wise man, a person who has wisdom, again, you know the right thing and then you do the right thing. A wise man, how will you know them? How can you recognize them? Well, a, a wise man is going to hear and then increase learning. So 
whatever it is that's being conveyed to you, whether it's Solomon or any other source giving you information, if you're wise, you're going to heed those things and you're going to collect them. They're going to be something that you accumulate to yourself. So you'll be able to identify the wise man because they will hear things and they'll hear it and they'll perceive what it is. They'll take the instruction from it. It's not just noise to them. They're cutting through the noise, getting to the actual words and the intent behind it. And then they are taking those things and putting them into practice. That's how you'll be able to tell a person who's wise. They will hear and then they will increase in learning. They're going to add and they're going to grow in the things that are learned. It's cumulative, the things that you learn over a lifetime. So again, I've watched so many things happen over the, the course of my life as a believer. I've watched things that happen in the church. I've watched things that have happened outside the church. After a while, you get to see the same things repeated so often that you pretty much can tell what the outcome is going to be before the outcome has actually happened. Why? Because it's exactly the same as I've seen it so many times. Now, doesn't mean you jump to conclusions or anything else. You're going to have to let things play out, but you got a pretty good idea. Hey, this is where it's going to be headed. So if you see something that's potentially, you know, headed that way, like, man, I've seen this movie before and you see people participating in it. It's always a really good thing to say, just in case you haven't seen it, watch this happen before. So let me give you a little bit of an idea. I have a feeling this is the direction that it's going. It's good to pass that information along. Now, it's again, it's not like thus says the Lord. He's shown me I've, I'm, and I'm going to be a prophet here. It's not that. It's just now I've seen this so many times and I know how like the devil would want to work. I also know how God wants to work in these things because I've watched it so many times. Let me pass along to you what it is that I've learned. It's a you, you accumulate those things. So as a Christian, it's always best not to forget what you've learned so far. Remember that because it may serve you well down the road. Now, a guy like Solomon, who's been through an awful lot, again, time as a king. If you've had time as a king, you've seen a whole heck of a lot. You've actually had to make decisions that affect an entire nation. And of course, if you're the king of Israel, above every other king that has ever been, that, that of any other nation that there's ever been, you're leading God's people. So the idea that you're in the crosshairs by the devil more than any other man in that position could be is obvious. So clearly he's seen some stuff. And so if, if I had a chance at this point in time, and if he was alive today, I'd want to hear what he has to say. I'd also want to be able to say, but I also want to be able to say, yeah, just because you're the wisest guy that's ever lived doesn't mean that you've lived it that way. So I'm going to learn by a lot of your mistakes. And he made tons of them. So it's a good thing for us to be able to look to somebody who has understanding but accumulate that stuff and don't forget it. Because <laughs> I've said it this way. I sat under my pastor for 25 years. And when it came to things that I saw Jack do, there were times that I just, and this is the lion's share, like almost with not a lot of, uh, of examples, something else. I would look at the things that he did and thought, just God gave him discernment. He's, he's learned an awful lot. And what he did was just great. There are those times, and it would be the same thing with me as anybody had watched me. They would say, yeah, I probably would have done that one different. So it's not that anybody's going to be perfect, but the idea that you learn things over time, if you apply what you've learned, you will be a very good example to those that, that God has put in your trust. So a wise man will hear and he will increase in learning. He's going to accumulate those things and he's going to learn things and he'll, he'll continue those on. A man of understanding or knowledge, he's going to attain wise counsel. What will be the end of it? A person who's done all the things that he's mentioned to this point is going to not only seek out wise counsel, but be able to offer wise counsel down the road. Solomon's a great example. Again, I don't know that you would have... <laughs> You never want to listen to what somebody says without bringing their their um, counsel against the word of God ever. I don't care who they are and I don't care how much you trust them. Still take anything that they tell you against the word of God, period. But I, I can say this as a man walking with the Lord for now 39 years. I think my counsel to you now at 39 years of walking with the Lord is probably better than my first year. So why? Because I've learned stuff and I've 
understood the Bible better now over the years. I've understood by watching things play out, my counsel would probably be better. So I think you understand where I'm going with that one. So this is all just think about how practical is this? This all makes perfect sense. Nothing here is like, man, I'd never considered that. This is really kind of elementary. You learn things over a lifetime and what you learn, it's good to put into practice doing what is the right thing. And if a person is smart, they're going to pay attention to the things that they hear from someone or the experiences that they go through, and they're going to make these right judgments. They're going to be able to discern the difference between right and wrong, and they can make the right decisions. Doesn't mean that they always will. Doesn't mean that the flesh isn't going to get in the way, but nothing that he is saying here is kind of unknown to us. And it doesn't have to be terribly profound to be brilliant and to be obviously true. So again, he's saying things that I don't think any of us would look at and go, yeah, I don't know that I, I, I don't think that that's right or that's correct. I don't think that that's really wise. All of this is really wise. It's really good. It's really solid. But it's something that I think innately all of us know. And the longer that we walk with the Lord, the more sense this stuff makes. So he goes on and it is then to understand a proverb or what is being taught, what's being shown, these little comments, these little observations that he has, these proverbs, when he just surveys things and gives his own little, you know, his own little take on all of these matters. If they're based in knowledge and wisdom and they're godly, they're judicious, they're just, they're righteous, they're equitable. When he says the things that he says, then the people reading and hearing them could say, amen, I would want to follow that. So he says to understand a proverb and uh, an enigma. Interesting word that he, he mentions here that uh, an enigma is something that you would you would see something being played out and you would just be able to interpret it accurately. You would see what it is and you'd be able to read the situation, the enigma. It's enigmatic. That's the word that we use sometimes. So we can get into day to day things and whatever it is. Sometimes people will call it nuance. It's situations that you get into that are just kind of, man, it could be this. It could be that. It's just kind of it's not so black and white. Well, knowledge, wisdom, all the instruction, all the things that he has mentioned, everything that's there, you can take those things that are not so black and white and you can make a wise, discerned, you know, intent in your decision and you can do the right, take the right course of action. So he says, um, and then also the words of the wise and their riddles. So you'll be able to see things that are said by people that might be hidden from the rest of the world but you can read them, you can understand them. Now, let's remember at this point, as we read these as the church, we already have a lot of built-in stuff that really works to our benefit. We have one that, that is above them all, and that is the person of the Holy Spirit residing in the life of the believer. So it's faster to my understanding, if I'm in tune with where the Spirit's leading and the instruction that he would give me, that's like real time. The Lord can be speaking through the Holy Spirit to me, and it's like yes or no, right, left, right, wrong, up, down, sideways. All those things can be told to me in real time right there. So we have this benefit that Solomon didn't necessarily have. A lot of times it's more intuitive. It's more what he thinks with his own mind. And of course, we're supposed to do that as well. But we have that, that wonderful helper that was promised to us, the Holy Spirit, who lives and resides in the believer, who gives that instruction. So again, there's a dimension in this that is just far beyond what he could have understood. So that person who has wisdom and now to us even a further expansion of it that we have the holy spirit that we can then understand what are the riddles and these are those deep profound things that are maybe hidden from the everyday human being but we're able to see them much differently because first of all the the, the bible speaks about them we have that that uh, witness of the holy spirit who also instructs us in these things and then I've left verse seven uh, for the uh, the last part of this because it's a perfect example of what we're going to see for the rest of this, where he says, now, <clears throat> the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. So the structure of this is going to be familiar kind of going throughout. He's got 
you have the wise and you have the foolish. The wise will be known by these things, the foolish will be known by that. Or they will demonstrate their foolishness by these things. The wise will demonstrate their wisdom by these things. So there's the side by side, there's the comparison on a parallel track. One is favorable, one is unfavorable. That's laid out right here, so it's going to give us kind of a template for what we'll see going forward. And it's, it's the first part. Now, the fear of the Lord. Fear can mean a couple of different things here, depending on context, because it's the same word. There can be things, and, and it's the same basic understanding in the New Testament. <clears throat> so when I look at the Lord and I think of God, my creator, am I afraid of him? Is that the fear that I have of the Lord? Absolutely not. I'm not afraid of him. He loves me. He gave his son to die on a cross to forgive me of my sin. And he calls me his son. Jesus calls me his friend. What have I to fear of him? So I don't have a terrifying, go hide in the corner, find some place to be safe. But I have a fear in the way of awe and respect. And I'm just I'm at an end of myself when I consider who he is. That fear of the Lord is where wisdom begins. It's the beginning of wisdom. So if I have a situation placed before me, but in the back of my mind, I know that the Lord desires things of me and he has given me instruction. And because I have such awe and such respect for him, my decision is going to be wisdom. I'm going to find, I'm going to follow the way of wisdom. I'm not going to do something that's rebellious. God is the one who is there watching and he has given me knowledge. And so what I'm going to do with that knowledge is put it into practice in a favorable way that will keep me in fellowship with him and not in a place of, of regret because I didn't follow what he had instructed me to do. So the fear of the Lord, if you want to know what, what is the basis of wisdom and making the right decision in your course of action based on what you know, because God has demonstrated to you what is correct, wisdom would apply that. And it's all found in this. I love him. I respect what he has done. I have such awe and respect for who he is because he loves me to the extent that he did, that he has forgiven me of my sin. Why would I want to do something that would, that would be wrong? Because that would not be wisdom. Uh, that's the opposite of wisdom. That's to be willful and to make the error of doing something that should not be done. So notice by contrast to that, the fool, though, this is by contrast. However, the fool despises wisdom and it does and despises, of course, instruction. So once again, if we're thinking about the wise person and the foolish person, it's not as much that we need to know what's the definition. If I was to look it up in the dictionary as fool, you don't need that. You can, it's really written here. So you could say, if you want to know what a fool looks like, here's how he's going to demonstrate it. If you want to know what a wise person looks like, here's how they'll demonstrate it. The wise person is going to do because they love God. They're going to do what he's asked them to do. The fool hates, despises, has a seething contempt for God and for his instruction. So if a person has that as their operating premise, I, I hate God, I don't want to do what he has to say, they're going to despise the wisdom that God gives. They're just going to do whatever seems right to them. They will ignore the things that God has to say because they have no reverence for him. They will have fear of him someday. Right now they don't. How many times have we said, and I got to say it, it's, it's election season, when I hear people who have absolute contempt for the things that God says are important to him, and they quote scripture, trying to justify who they are when they are absolute enemies of his by the things that they advocate for and do. I just think that's those are people who are playing to a crowd, but they hate God. They hate him by their lifestyles, by the things that they say and the things that they do, but they use him as a prop to, to the people who are gullible. And we see that stuff all the time. And I'm not talking about any particular candidate. I'm seeing it from people all over the place. It's election season. And if they're standing in front of a church, especially, they're going to quote scripture as though they believe it. They are liars. So 
How do we know that, who the fool is? The fool is going to demonstrate who they are because they will actually despise wisdom. And that, that's proven by the way that they conduct their own lives. Everything that they do is unbiblical. And so that's how they will demonstrate it because they have a despising of wisdom and the instruction, again, offered by God and ultimately by his people as well. But let's make sure we always bring it back to the same place. Where is the source for wisdom, knowledge, instruction, everything that we've seen here written in these first six verses, what's the source of it? God is the source of it, but how did he convey that and communicate it to mankind? He's done so in his word. And again, it's why people, it's, it's, it's an amazing thing. People will claim to be Christians, and yet they will openly and defiantly um, live their lives completely contrary to what the Bible teaches. So I would want to say, why would you call yourself a Christian when the only source of what a Christian is, <clears throat> is the word of God? And yet you will sometimes even admit, I will, I don't do what the Bible has to say because I don't recognize its authority or it's been translated so many times or blah, blah, blah. It's your interpretation, whatever. I would want to say, well, if that's your view of it, you have such a low view of the scripture, why call yourself a Christian when the only place to identify what a Christian is, is based upon the word that you're now rejecting? So that kind of reasoning is what Solomon's getting to here. We are supposed to recognize that we as believers have a reasoned belief system. People don't have to agree with it. The world's never going to agree with it. But God hasn't called us to some blind faith. There is wisdom that is found in God's word, and we can find it if we look for it, and we can see how it makes sense to us that we can walk in it again, practical things. Nothing that Solomon is going to be saying about or talking about here is, is something you can't find in scripture or based upon what he knows at the particular time that he says it. There's a couple of places where I'd say, I wouldn't say it that way. But again, I have to remember Solomon's saying these things 3000 years ago, as opposed to right here and right now, and based on what we know and what God's revealed to us. So Proverbs, beginning of this, we'll pick it up at verse eight next week, and we'll start to get into the content and the details of it. Uh, for now, we just kind of wanted to get into the introductory part of this and, and uh, kind of looking a little bit into the life and who he is. So uh, if you have any questions on anything that I've shared from the beginning to the end of this study, even the things that I said at the very beginning that weren't really about the study, but about the church and about the, the voting and all that stuff. If you have any questions, contact me through the email and that's at Old Path Theology. That's great. Or put it in the comment section here on YouTube. Also, all of our Bible studies are available both in video and in audio, not just on YouTube, but also uh, on our website. Those are available there too. I always want to have a backup copy of, uh, of the things that, that uh, I have just in case for any reason YouTube ever goes down or the content uh, is missing, I have a backup for it. And uh, I, I find that to be very, very important that's there. Also, if there's anything in the content that you hear in the studies, and you think might make a nice little clip, we're going to start doing those real soon uh, to drive uh, attention to the website and to the Bible studies. Again, it's my only desire is to get the Word of God out in a very simple, hopefully easy to understand format that people can study right along with us and learn the Bible at, at, a, at a basic level that we can really all understand and, and sink our teeth into. So again, we'll pick up at verse eight next week in Proverbs chapter one. Uh, join us on Thursdays for the book of Revelation as well. And uh, I look forward to sharing that with you next week. <music>